Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the Book of Revelation. This is lesson number five in that series for February 2 of 2019, entitled The Seven Seals. Now we're not talking about sea animals here, we're talking about something that you stamp on a document to hold it closed. So, before we begin, as usual, we'd like to have a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we know that, and you know, that these passages in Revelation, some of them are a real challenge to understand. There have been different ideas about how they should be interpreted. We ask now that you will give us some guidance as we discuss together these challenging portions of Scripture. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Revelation 4, that we've looked at already, turns the camera, and it wasn't really a camera, it's God, it, was, it was John's vision, suddenly he looked up and there was the throne room in heaven. So now let's see how good your memories are, guys and gals. Who's in the throne room in heaven? Father. The Father. Four living creatures. Four living creatures. Twenty-four elders. Twenty-four elders. And hundreds of millions of angels. Hundreds of millions of angels is right. Big room. Now. And the Lamb. And the Lamb. Yes, please, let's not forget the Lamb. So, try to think about this now. Every move that God makes, who's watching? All of those people. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean they're just standing around with nothing to do. I'm sure they have a lot of activities to do, but in general, that's true. They're all very carefully observing what God is doing, what he's going to do next, and they probably have ability to keep in touch wherever they are in the universe. If they're doing an errand somewhere, they probably are able to keep in touch with the throne room. So often we think of, of, of when we pray, we think of God is up there and he's maybe sitting on a throne or he's standing there and we're talking to him sort of in the private. Well, it's not exactly like that. Uh, God is, everything God does, he has to do it in front of that enormous audience. But then in Revelation 5, we run into some challenges. There's a crisis right in the throne room of God. And what's the crisis? Do you remember? There was a scroll that no one seemed to be able to open. And the, throne, the, the scroll seems to be sitting maybe on the arm or something, at least close to the Father. Does this mean that God the Father was not able to open this scroll? That doesn't seem quite right, does it? may have come from him, though. Maybe it came from him. Good point. Probably so. He's, but, uh, he's the um, God of eternity mm -hmm. and, you know, huge. Mm -hmm. So that might have came from that somehow. Okay, that's a good possibility. Now, as we study the seals, we need to remember this is not what's inside the scroll. We're going to talk about that separately. The seals are what's on the in those. Remember those old days that these were these were papers rolled up on a, on a some kind of a stick or something like that, and and at the end when the paper comes to the end. There's little daubs of wax, and these seven seals are there. So it means that you have to open these seals in order to find out what's inside the scroll. Before you can hear anything about what's inside, you have to get past the seals. Well, we're going to discover even today that, well, and probably all of you out there, if you've had some experience with the book of Revelation, know that there are multiple ways to interpret some of these passages in Revelation. And we're going to look at a couple of ones that I consider to be complementary, two different approaches to understanding uh, chapters 5 and 6 especially, and uh, we'll later talk about over in chapter 8, verse 1. So, in, and then in that interlude between basically chapter 7, um, we're going to talk about another group, and Carrie, I think you can tell us a little bit about that group. 
Yes, I'm going to be using the English Standard Version of the Bible. I'm starting on chapter 7. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from, from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Sivian, from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin was sealed. Now, Carrie, I'm going to ask you to jump over verses 9 to 13 and go to 14 because we're going to focus on that section later. All right. Let me find 14 here. Yes. I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And you want to read verse 1 of chapter 8? Yes. The seventh seal in the golden censer, it's entitled at the start of the chapter. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Okay. So if you remember back in chapter 4, heaven was, the throne room in heaven was a busy place. Probably a semi-noisy place. There's people talking. There's all sorts of going on. We have the, the living creatures shouting. We have other things going on. And then all of a sudden in chapter 8, verse 1, there's silence. So something happened. And that's what we're going to try to talk about today. What happened? And um, we go back now, and I'm going to read um, the first six verses, first eight verses of chapter 6. Then I saw the Lamb break open the first of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice that sounded like thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. He rode out as a conqueror to conquer. Then the Lamb broke open the second seal. I heard the second living creature say, Come! Another horse came out, a red one. Its rider was given the power to bring, bring war on the earth so that people should kill each other. He was given a large sword. And the Lamb broke open the third seal, and I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand. I heard what sounded like a voice coming from among the four living creatures, which said, A liter of wheat for a day's wages, and three liters of barley for a day's wages, but do not harm the olive trees or the vineyards. Then the Lamb broke open the fourth seal, and I heard the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there was a pale colored horse, its rider was named Death, and Hades followed close behind. They were given authority over a quarter of the earth to kill by means of war, famine, disease, and wild animals. Wow. Okay, now let's just, just remind ourselves the sequence here. Who's, who's opening the seals? Uh, the lamb. The lamb. <coughs> and who's making the shout, who's doing the shouting? The different the uh, people in the, throne the, room. the living the living creatures, living creatures right? each living one creatures. calls out yeah, a different calls out whatever like this. So this is a this is a cooperative effort that we're talking about now. You can 
uh, and there's many, many verses referred to in this lesson, and if you're interested in getting all the materials, you of course can look in our adult uh, Sabbath school Bible study guide, but you get some additional information if you get our handout from uh, theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G on our website. So in our last lesson, we discussed the fact that the scroll, the scroll contains the history of the great controversy and the history of our world from the beginning of the rebellion in heaven, presumably until the restoration of peace and harmony at the third coming. So what are we saying here? How, how much a period of, of, of history is covered here? The whole earth. Yeah, the whole story, right? Yeah, from beginning to years. end, yes. <clears throat> so now let's see if we can figure out how that might break down into these uh, different parts. In Revelation 6, we see four horses bursting onto the scene. And different translations will have slightly different words for this. But we have the first horse with a rider representing conquering. That's the first seal. The second horse bringing war. The third horse, or third seal, bringing famine. And the fourth seal, bringing death. Now, uh, they were given authority over a quarter of the earth to kill by means of war, famine, disease, and wild animals. Wow. By the way, are those uh, strange occurrences or, or have a famine and death and, and war and conquering by enemies? Have that been pretty much the history of our world since sin entered? All we have yes. to do is turn on the news. It's been repeated it's over and over yes. again. Over exactly. Over. Well, why, why couldn't it be the, the seals are actually the story? The seals okay, are actually the story. so how would the they story. be the story? Because it, as, as history goes, the seals get broken. So you mean one by one? One by one. Well, not necessarily one by one, but um, conceptually one by one. And then, what if the... First of all, it wasn't that nobody could open the seals. It's n that nobody was worthy to open the seals. Okay, well, that they, means, they, they couldn't either, in other words, if they're not worthy. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. They probably felt like they couldn't open it, that they, weren't, they okay. weren't really worthy to do it. So you're saying it wasn't a question of physical ability to open the seals, it was a question of whether you're authorized. Yeah. No, that you right. actually don't feel like you can do it. I see, okay. See, see so the father couldn't feel, didn't feel like he could do it? Well, he's the one that gave it out. Yeah. But why doesn't so, he just open it up then if he can do it? Because because something had to happen. It would be like telling the devil why he couldn't do the things he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You had to go and go through the earth history to understand what was written in the, in the scroll. It's now we not have necessarily... I wouldn't think it was necessarily the story of the earth. I would think it's the story of the truth. And well, the truth couldn't be understood unless you've gone through this discipline. Well, what we have is two quotations, which I don't have in front of me right now, from our last lesson from Ellen White that say that what's in the scroll was a history of, the, of this earth. So that's the basis on which well, I said that. You, it depends how you, you receive that, though. Yeah. Because... So we need to move on anyway because we've got a lot of material to cover. The question here is ultimately, how does God bring the great controversy to a conclusion? And there's several suggestions. I mean, obviously, if God wanted to bring the great controversy to conclusion by use of force, he should have just zapped the devil the moment he rebelled in heaven, and we would have never, nobody, he could have wiped the memory of the devil, or Lucifer at that point in time, out of the memories of everybody in heaven, and nobody would have even known that Evil had just been nipped in the butt. Wouldn't that be a good way to do it? So we're going to persuade through intimidation. The other worlds would have said to themselves, this is just what the devil was telling us. Yeah. Okay. Or, or if, as you implied, that, that God could just erase their memories, the fact is that it all could rise again because of yeah. free will. Yep. And that would not have been loving it's a contrary. thing to do. It's contrary to God's character of love. Yeah. Okay. Well, it doesn't make sense, actually. Why would you 
just create a world and have it go bad and say, oh, oh, and then well, erase everybody's see. mind and then start over again and have it do it again. Oh, oh, erase everybody's yeah. mind. It'd be just a big loop yeah. going through eternity. That yeah, way. assuming that, you, you, that that's what would actually happen, yeah. Well, there's another story about uh, Jesus, presumably, riding on a white horse in Revelation 19, 11 to 6. Let's look at that. Some people have said this is a parallel to what we just read in Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True. It is with justice that he judges and fights his battles. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and he wore many crowns on his head. Now, for people who are real critical readers of, uh, and want to look at the original languages and so forth here, we need to understand that these crowns are different. The ones here in, in Revelation 19 are crowns that a king would wear. The ones in Revelation 6 are crowns that a one who, someone who victor. wins a race, it's, it's a crown of a victor. So it's a little bit different. He had a name written on him, but no one except himself knows what it is. The robe he wore was covered with blood. We don't have anything like that in, in Revelation 6. His name is the Word of God. The armies have been followed him, riding on white horses and dressed in clean white linen. So those last two parts, there's nothing like that in, in Revelation in, yeah, in chapter 6. Well, one of the challenges, because we believe that many things in the book of Revelation are reflections of something that was said already in the Old Testament. And I can just tell you uh, that I'll just pick a couple of spots. Look at Psalm 45, 4 and 5. Ride on in majesty to victory for the defense of truth and justice. Your strength will win you great victories. Your arrows are sharp. They pierce the hearts of your enemies. Nations fall down at your feet. Now, does that sound like uh, a warfare where you just sort of mow down your enemies? It does, doesn't it? And I can tell you there are lots of verses like that in the Old Testament. So one way of interpreting Revelation is, and some of, of you have come across this already, that Jesus came the first time and he was nice and loving and kind, but the next time he's going to come and he's going to fix everybody who doesn't agree with him. Does that sound right to you? That's nonsense. No. Yeah. I mean, what, the sin problem began in heaven and uh, went on fairly, well, if you read Genesis 1, 1 and 2, the earth became a chaos after, uh, at the end of uh, Genesis 1, 1, and then we have a story of recreation, Genesis 1, verse 2, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you got, even with the flood, you've got, you've got almost a recreation. Yeah. And many in various ways, Hebrew 1. Hebrews 1 uh, uh, through 3. Now, many people who look at the book of Revelation feel that the seven churches and now the, the, the seven seals and the seven trumpets and sevens and sevens, all the seven sevens, that we should try to figure out how to line them up side by side. So let's consider that possibility. We've talked about the white horse who comes out conquering. Uh, does that match the the church at Ephesus we read about in, in, in Revelation 3? I'm sorry, Revelation 2. Well, in Revelation 6, this white horse comes forth to conquer, and it looks like he's, he's, you know, he's just winning everything, and he's wearing this victor's crown. But what do we read in, under, about the church in Ephesus? They're, they, were, they originally were loving, but then what's happening? They're losing their first love. So that doesn't seem to fit too well. So then we go to the church at Smyrna. Um, compare that with, uh, look, at, look at our second horse, Revelation 6, C and 4. Then the Lamb broke open the second seal, and I heard the second living creature say, Come. Another horse came out, a red one. And so we, we, we immediately jumped to the conclusion that this has something to do with war and bloodshed. Um, now it's true that we, we, we believe that the Smyrna church represents a time period from about A.D. 100 to about 323, and it was a time of terrible persecution for Christians off and on. It wasn't always persecution, but there were several times during that time when it was a lot of persecution. Um, is that the reason for the blood? Well, Maybe. they struggled against persecution. The rider on this horse takes peace away from the earth. 
So that's a possibility. And then there's the black horse. And its writer describes a very serious situation. Um, this is a famine. You can't describe this, I think, in any other words. I mean, you, according to this thing, based on what we know of the conditions in the days of John, a person could work hard all day long and earn just enough food to, pay, to, to, to satisfy the man himself who's working. And, if he, and that would be if he bought wheat. If he bought barley, which was cheaper, uh, he, he might be able to buy enough barley to support a very small family. So, and and it, that doesn't say anything about housing or about uh, shelter, shelter or, or clothing or anything else. I mean, this is a, this is a really a, a difficult time. But then at the end of that, it says, do not harm the olive trees and the vineyards. What does that have to do with a famine? Well, one possible interpretation of this serves is that it represents the corruption of the gospel by the introduction of pagan ideas into the church as the church gained political power under Constantine and his successors. So what time period are we talking about here? After. Anybody remember those dates? This would be from Constantine be really introduced the idea of Christianity about 323 yeah. and the Roman power you know, really began to use the, the civil authority to support its, its doctrines in 538. So we're talking about 323 to 538 here. Um, now, this wasn't the time of the greatest famine of God's word. It was a time when when things were becoming more difficult. But it was the the time after that as a time when there was a real famine of God's word. So again. Mm. And when we talk about a famine in God's word, does that remind you of any other passages we've talked about? Daniel 12, 4 is the one that's most, fami most f familiar to people. And he said to me, and now, Daniel, close the book and put a seal on it until the end of the world. Meanwhile, many people will waste their efforts trying to understand what is happening. You know, in the King James it said, many people will run to and fro. Mm -hmm. Knowledge shall be increased. Remember? Mm-hmm wonder what's happening. And then there's the fourth horse, which is ashen gray in color, suggesting death. And he's followed by Hades, which is the Greek word for the place of the dead, or a graveyard. Millions of people were destroyed by sword, hunger, death, and wild beasts during what we would call the Dark Ages. Fortunately, none of those deaths were or are permanent. Jesus Christ will raise everyone at either the second or the third coming. So, uh, does that, do these four horses seem to be parallel to the four churches? Now this last one would be Thyatira, obviously. Now yeah, there's some similarities. So let's look at some other possibilities. In Revelation 6.6, 6, it mentioned the oil and the wine. What does the oil represent in scripture? Mm. Holy the Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in many places. What about the new wine? Symbolizes salvation. Salvation, salvation by Jesus Christ, yeah. Fortunately, this suggests that even in the worst of times, the Holy Spirit is still working for his faithful people and salvation is still available through Jesus Christ. We think of the time, the days of, uh, from, from 538 to around about the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, was the Holy Spirit still active? Yes. What was he doing? Who was holding up the banner during those days? Was that the Waldenses? The Waldenses, Waldenses, yeah. Waldenses, the Albigenses. Waldenses. Albigenses, yes. And there were people doing that. We don't know as much about them over in, in southern, what would now be southern Russia. There were people doing that in Ethiopia. So in the periphery, or now the, the Waldenses, they lived right in Italy. And they lived up in the mountains and hid, and, but they, they would teach these young men and they would go out selling things and in the process they would find people who they thought would be open to suggestions and they would teach them the gospel. So the Holy Spirit continued to work. Ellen White describes times when uh, young people would go to a major city, like she describes them going to Paris. And all of a sudden, 
the church became alarmed because there were people around here reading the Bible and finding out that the stuff that the church has been teaching isn't the whole story. And who's spreading this stuff? And they, would, they were searching all over the place and never could find. And it just seemed like the whole city was being excited by this thing, but they never could figure out who was, who was responsible for it. I'm sure God was protecting whoever was in the process of doing that. Well, um, then all of a sudden, in Revelation 6, 9, and 10, now we have had four horses here, four riders on four horses, different colors, and all of a sudden we have this. Then the Lamb broke open the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been killed because they had proclaimed God's word and had been faithful in their witnessing. They shouted in a loud voice, Almighty Lord, holy and true, how long will it be until you judge the people on earth and punish them for killing us? Okay? So, does that sound like a reasonable question? Mm-hmm. I mean, suppose if you think about back to Cain and Abel, what did God say about Abel's blood? It cries, it cries out. out unto me. Exactly. Even from a ground. Exactly. <clears throat> so here's, and when we talk about souls, the word here for souls is talking about people. Genesis 2 7 makes it very clear that souls are not some kind of thing that floats around in space or whatever like that. No. And where are these souls located? Under the altar. Under the altar. Under the altar. What happens under the altar? You're under the blood. You are covered mm -hmm. by, the blood, by the blood. And what did the priests do? <clears throat> they threw the blood of these sacrificial animals. In some cases, it was probably quite a lot of blood, and they threw it at the base of this altar. I would think that would be kind of a messy. Mm -hmm. they, might, they must have had <clears throat> drainage channels. Some kind of something <laughs> drainage, yeah. So if they're under the altar, do they have basements under there? No. Well then. Well, this is. Remember, we're not talking about. We're not talking about real people. We're talking about blood here. That represents we're real about people. Talking souls too. Yeah. But yeah. So if they're people, you just said they were people, and they're under the. They're under the. Well, um, so my question altar. is, we we go back to the story of Abel. Was Abel alive? No. His blood was crying out. That's the same story with this. With so these his, people. His blood was in little chambers under the ground, so it would cry out? Who? You mean Abel? Blood. No, yeah. it, was, it was spilled out on the ground, just like yeah. this blood is spilled, spilled out on the floor of the temple in so front of the altar. So people are spilled out on, under the temple. Well, that's a, this, is a, the, this is a symbolic representation, yeah. That's, that's the way God chose to represent it. I think that's my point. Yeah. Well, so, these, these martyrs are wearing white robes. What does white robes represent? Purity. Purity, Purity righteousness. The good deeds of God's people, it just says specifically in one place. The good deeds of God's people. So all of a sudden now, we've been talking about horses and riders and war and famine and conquering. And now all of a sudden we're talking about blood under the altar. What? What is the relationship between those two? Not obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Right up front, right? Well, clearly, those people are saying, God, why haven't you done something? Why aren't you doing something now? And those verses um, are reflected in other parts of Scripture. Matthew 24, 29, and 30. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 10, which we don't have time to read right now, but um, actually, uh, let me do, do read verses 12 to 14. And I saw the Lamb break open the sixth seal. There was a violent earthquake, and the sun became black like coarse black cloth, and the moon turned completely red like blood. The stars fell down to the earth like unripe figs falling from the tree when a strong wind shakes it. The sky disappeared like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. So, what does that remind you of? Some of the more recent but past history. Yeah. So I think every Adventist who studied about the history of our church will immediately say, well, that must be talking about which earthquake? The Lisbon earthquake. Lisbon earthquake. The Lisbon earthquake of 1755. And what else? The, the moon, the sun darkened, the moon turned. When was that? The moon turned 
kind of blood. May 19, 1780. And when did the stars fall? November 13, 1833. Wow. So, but look at the next verse. But then we read verse 14 saying, The sky disappears like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island and moved out of their places. Has that happened yet? No. No. So are we right there between verses 13 and 14 now? So. <laughs> Maybe. It, it looks like so. it. <laughs> looks like that, doesn't it? See, that first interval is about 15 years. Yeah. Then you have 53 years. And then between that, in 1833 and now, we're coming up to 200 years. That's right. But it's God's time, not ours. Yeah. Okay, so now we look at the next couple, th next three verses. Look at Revelation uh, 15 to 7, six, chapter 6, verses 15 to 17. Then the kings of the earth, the rulers and the military chiefs, the rich and the powerful, and all other people, slave and free, hid themselves in caves and under rocks on the mountains. They called out to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the eyes of the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. The terrible day of their anger is here, and who can stand against it? Now, is there any question about what that's referring to? That's got to be the second that's coming. The second coming, and the people ha who have rejected God has to be the second coming. If you interpret it literally, calling for rocks and mountains to fall. Yeah. Well, how would you well, like to interpret it? Well, just to throw, you know, it, in the earlier part here, we're talking about the great re revival mm -hmm. I, that happened. Well, about the same time, atheists were. Uh, working against that by uh, looking at the rocks and, and trying to build up a, mm. a long age uh, intellectual way mm. of saying, well, we don't need, we God. Don't need God. So I don't know, that's well, maybe I mean, far fetched. That's a good idea. The question is, how does that fit with people calling for the rocks and mountains to fall on them? Well, to hide them. In other words, they're they're oh, hide them from the ideas about God and so forth. Right. So if you've got ideas from the rocks and the mountains that uh, this earth has been here for mm -hmm. billions of years or whatever, at that time they wouldn't have come up with that number. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, then, as uh, one said later, it gives atheists an intellectual uh, evolution gives atheists an evolution. Uh, athe atheists, uh, an in intellectual way of dealing with, with things. Yeah, the, an explanation for things that I have no other explanation except God. Right. Yeah. So, so it wasn't it wasn't a way to hide from God. It was. Well, it is, because yeah. then you don't have to look at him. You, you, look, you can pretend like he doesn't exist. You know, if, in Romans, uh, one is it that says that it's obvious. Is it or is it too? It's obvious uh, from the things that God has made that of yeah. His great power and presence. So, Rom Romans, so Romans one twenty. So if they distort that, then maybe they're uh, so that they can see it as oh, God isn't there. Yeah, There's we don't need millions and millions of years. This uh, verse describes it pretty much as a real literal happening, though. Yeah. which fits pretty good with our concept of the second coming. Now earlier we referred to Revelation 19 and said maybe it applies, uh, it's a parallel to Revelation 6 in some ways. And look at how Revelation 19 goes on. Then I saw an angel standing on the sun. He shouted in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for God's great feast, Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, soldiers, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all people, slave and free, great and small. When is that going to happen? Is that going to be literal? Is that going to, I mean, That's is this, I raised the, the is this all? The of, of, of uh, symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. What? Would that be after um, Jesus comes? The rights, the righteous wicked? are, record, are yeah, resurrected, and they're gone to heaven, and the wicked are dead. And well, this verse makes me wonder: Are all the animals going to die at the second coming? Probably not. I don't so know. So could we, we have could we have a thousand years where there's nobody nobody on the earth except the devil and his angels and a whole lot of animals and birds and birds. Would they survive Fish here without us? Well, I think they, the animals would survive just fine without us. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, again, suddenly another shocker, we come to Revelation 7, 1 to 4. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, and Carrie read us, read us this earlier, so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or any, against any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. Now here we have a different kind of a steel, seal, and what's he doing? He called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. Now this is not a seal on some scroll somewhere. This is God's faithful people being marked with a seal on their foreheads. And I was told that the number of those who were marked with God's seal on their foreheads was 144,000. They were from the 12 tribes. Of Israel, and we've already talked about that. But briefly. is that Act One of the Seven Seals? Is that Act One of the Seven no, Seals? No, is that one of the? Is that a? This is an, me Remember that in each of the, in each of the sevens we have in Revelation, there's six, and sometimes they're divided up in some ways. But there's six, and then there's an interlude, and then there's seven, and that we're now in the. This is in the interlude between six and seven. Between six and seven. Mm -hmm, between six and seven. Okay. And these people have come through terrible persecution. They have kept their robes white by remaining loyal to God. So, now, where do we fit in this picture? Nobody, no, none of us have close friends who've been martyred because of their faith? Well, there are some people in parts of the world that have been yep. mm -hmm. martyred for their faith. Mm -hmm. And it's getting harder and harder. I mean, obviously, God, as God sort of withdraws a little bit of his presence from the earth and the devil becomes, I mean, like there are places in India now where it's against the law to change your religion. Well, it is in Muslim countries, too. Yeah. yeah. So. Unless you become a Muslim. Oh, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can be a closet Christian. But then they <laughs> fight amongst themselves, so it doesn't yeah. stop just there. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, there. That's right. <clears throat> yeah. Well, again, the question is, how should God respond? And once again, we can read verses Leviticus 26, God's curses, Deuteronomy 32, Ezekiel 14, where it says, you know, if you don't do what's right, God is going to zap you, almost it sounds like. But we don't think God is like that. Well, there's another po couple of possibilities. Zechariah has a couple of proph prophecies, Zechariah 1, 8 to 17, and Zechariah 6, 1 to 8. And the first one, there's horses, but they're different colors. And then the second one, there's chariots. And again, they're different colors. Um, does, that, does that impact our understanding of Revelation? Well, it's not obvious that there's a parallel. Well, next we have the seven trumpets coming up. And it has generally been believed by scholars that the seven trumpets, we'll talk about later, is God's judgments against the wicked. Whereas this, the, the seals are God's judgment against the people who should have been faithful to him. Um, you can take that for whatever it's worth. Hmm. Without, without going into a lot of detail, there's evidence in the book of Revelation itself to suggest that the earthquake mentioned in Revelation 6.12, which we t traditionally believe was referring to the Lisbon earthquake, is different from the events recorded in verse 14, where the mountains moved out of their place and the islands disappear. That's, uh, that's a bigger earthquake. So what have we learned so far from the six seals? Do, what's the relationship between these six seals and the words in Revelation 4, for example, and the first part of Revelation 5, or, or most of Revelation 5? Is, they, is there supposed to be a relationship, or is that just a different section? Well, the there. Lamb is opening the scrolls, the scroll, mm -hmm. the, uh, breaking the different seals, and so we're seeing more and more of what's in the scroll. As okay, but no, we're not, we're not yet seeing what was in the scroll, because you have to open all seven seals before you can actually get the scroll open. So it's not open one seal and you see a little bit, open the other scroll. Depends uh, on how the scroll's set up. I've, I've seen it with kind of a, like the first one comes off and the second one. Oh, really? But those are just artists' conceptions. Yeah, well. People with imagination. Let's look at another possible way of, of looking at all this, these events, chapters 4 through 6. 
what was the, we, we've talked about a crisis that arose in the throne room of God. Can you think of any crisis that might have risen in the throne room of God? Nobody can think of one? Who well, used? No, eventually, initially, Lucifer rebelled yeah. against God. That was, that had to be a there, crisis. There, there must have been, that must have been the biggest crisis that ever happened. I mean, someone standing right in the center of that throne room, it rebels against God. I mean, it must have been a total shock for everybody. Except God, of course, he understood. But uh, you wonder how long Lucifer had been working, yes. uh, you know, trying to trying to influence the other angels before he came out as Open. rebe openly rebellious. Yeah. So we have some very thought-provoking quotations from Ellen White. I'd like us to think about right now, Margaret. I think okay. you have the next one. A crisis had arrived in the government of God. The earth was filled with transgression. The voices of those who had been sacrificed to human envy and hatred were crying beneath the altar for retribution. That was the fifth seal in Revelation 6, 9 to 11. All heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to help this elect. One word from him and the bolts of heaven would have fallen upon the earth, filling it with fire and flame. God had but to speak, and there would have been thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction. It's more imagery from the book of Revelation. The heavenly intelligences were prepared for a fearful manifestation of almighty power. Every move was watched with intense anxiety. The exercise of justice was expected. The angels looked for God to punish the inhabitants of the earth. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Do you think that was a shock to the angels? Yes. So what we're seeing here is that people standing, or not people, this would be angels, standing around the throne of God expected God to just do something, wipe out those wicked people. Now we usually think the angels are always so friendly and nice and they wouldn't think things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you want to go ahead? Okay, with intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah arise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth. And if God should do this, Satan was ready to carry out his plan for securing to himself the allegiance of heavenly beings. He had declared that the principles of God's government make forgiveness impossible. Had the world been destroyed, he would have claimed that his accusations were proved true. He was ready to cast blame upon God and to spread his rebellion to the worlds above. But instead of destroying the world, God sent his son to save it. Wow. Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page 37, paragraph 2. So what we're seeing here now is that the core, the center location in the great controversy is not planet Earth, even though this is where things take place. It's right in the throne room of God. There are actually people wondering, okay, God, what's God going to do next? And why doesn't he wipe out those wicked people? And people are raising those kind of questions right there in the throne room of God. Where would they get those inclinations to want to wipe out the earth? Wipe out everybody? Because they've never seen anything like that before. No. So yeah, but why would they even come up with that idea? That's what I'm saying. It doesn't seem reasonable in a way because they've never ever seen anything like that happen. But they, but, well, but why where did Satan they, get his inclination, so to speak? Well then, if, if they were wrong <coughs> the in angels. doing that and, they, and God did it a different way, that means that their ideas were wrong. Mm -hmm. So well, were they sinning? Well, you were, Not at you the could moment. Probably see, they could probably see how these people on earth were hurting each other and what they were doing mm -hmm. to each other. And the angel says, God, put a stop to that. It's yeah. horrible. Yeah. Right. They but were, do now you if they had them gone to down stop there. Stop by wiping them out? Well, yeah. That, that's that's one way. <laughs> that's one way to do yeah, it. But how would they get that idea? Well, I'm, I'm, I, well, I think they were very intelligent creatures, and they had thought of all the possibilities. And one possibility is just wipe those people out. We don't have, we don't know how many other things they were thinking. We're not told how many other things they were thinking. Well, but I don't one think they've ever seen anybody be wiped out before. How well, they had the flood. going to come to their head? What about the flood? Well, they, 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 they aren't we talking yet, before the flood? 
we're talking Are we about talking this, before the flood? Well, yeah, it talking about people sinning back here, so I maybe the, we're anyway. going to see this. Yeah, okay. We're talking about this before God's made a move to do anything. So what we see here is that angels in heaven are raising the same kind of questions that these people of these this blood under the altar is crying out to God, "Why don't you do something?" And what does God say? Well, let me give you a white robe. Just, just be patient a little bit longer. And the angels are saying, what? White robes and patience? We want to see some action here, right? The souls under the altar, you said there were people, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, re it's a reference to, I mean, souls, the word souls means people. So this had to happen after the people had lived and died, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? So when, when exactly does that happen? Well, well, we're, gonna we're gonna get some we ideas. We're gonna get some ideas. There's no was. beginning or end in certain places in scripture. Well, he seems to be no. going in a sequential. Yeah. Thing. Well, that was That's one possibility. Like. So now that I'm, I'm saying that. That was the seal, and the, that was b just about the Reformation time. Yeah, well, let's, let's move on. Jim? <clears throat> for centuries, God looked with patience and forbearance upon the cruel treatment given to his ambassadors had his holy law prostrate, despised, trampled underfoot. He swept away the inhabitants of the Noatian world with a flood. So here we have it. See, they've already seen that. Mm -hmm. But when the earth was again peopled, men drew away from God and renewed their hostility, manifesting bold defiance. Those whom God rescued from Egyptian bondage followed in the footsteps of those who had preceded them. Cause was followed by effect. The earth was being corrupted. The heavenly universe was amazed at God's patience and love. To save fallen humanity, the Son of God took humanity upon himself, laying aside his kingly crown and royal robe. He became poor that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. One with God, he alone was capable of accomplishing the work of redemption. And he consented to an actual union with man. In his sinlessness, he would bear every transgression. transgression. That's from the Review and Herald by Ellen White, July 17, 1900. And that well, is so amazing. Actual yeah. union with man. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is, very close to some of the things in the book of Revelation that we've been chapter 5 there. Is it possible that even the angels looked at God to punish the inhabitants of the earth? That's what she says. What kind of response did they expect from God? They said, God, you did it once, why not do it again? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, didn't they expect a responsible, response similar? Well, look at the next passage. This would be Dennis. Before Christ's first advent, the sin of refusing to conform to God's law had become widespread. Apparently, Satan's power was growing. His warfare against heaven was becoming more and more determined. A crisis had been reached. With an intense, with an intense interest, God's movements were watched by the heavenly angels. Would he come forth from his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity? Would he send fire, Sodom and Gomorrah, or flood, Noah, to destroy them? All heaven waited the bidding of their commander to pour out the vials of wrath, Revelation 15 and 16. And what, what, what's, what do we read in Revelation 15 and 16? That's the seven last plagues. I mean, vials of wrath. Yeah. yeah. Upon a rebellious world. One word from him, one sign, and the world, world would have been destroyed. The world's unfallen would have said, Amen, thou art, thou art righteous, O God, because thou hast exterminated rebellion. Ellen White. Wow. God's justice and love, signs of the times, August 27, 1902. Wow. And these are not the only passages reflecting that I idea. There are more. Gary? For centuries, God bore with the inhabitants of the old world, but at least guilt reached its limit. God saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every imagination of thought of the thought 
of his heart was only evil continually, and it repeated, re repented. repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Genesis 5, Genesis 6, 5 through 6. He came out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth, and by a flood cleansed the earth of its in iniquity. Notwithstanding the terrible lesson, men had no sooner begun to multiply once more than the rebellion and vice became widespread. Satan seemed to have taken control of the world. The time came that a change must be made or the image of God would be wholly obliterated from the hearts of 570? That's the, the, the top of page 570. Oh, the, the beings he had created. All heaven watched the movements of God with intense interest. Would he once more manifest his wrath? Would he destroy the world by fire? The angels thought that the time had come to strike the blow of justice when low to their wanderings, visions were unveiled the plan of salvation. Wonders, O heaven, and he is astonished and be astonished. O earth, God's oh, O earth, God sent his only begotten son to the world to save the world. Amazing grace. Herein is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4:10 King James Version Ellen G. White's Manuscript 22, January 10, 1890, from Ellen White's Diaries, wow. Battle Creek, Michigan. It's important to notice that the vials of wrath mentioned in this passage are taken from the seven last plagues in Revelation 15 and 16. Incredibly, the heavenly council standing around the throne of God apparently expected revenge from God. Is that really possible? Jim, I think you've got some words about that. Revelation 5, verse 6. Then I saw a lamb standing no, in the... You, the paragraph before that. The world's unfallen. I'm sorry. The world's unfallen would have said, Amen, thou art righteous, O God, because thou hast exterminated rebellion. Ellen White, God's justice and love. Yeah. Signs of the Times article, clear back in, eight, in 1902, Wow. 27. Okay, so there's another important point that needs to be made about Revelation 5-6, which is in the midst of our study for this week. You want to read that for us there? Then I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb appeared to have been killed. The Greek word excuse me, the Greek word implies a violent death, a slaughter, a mutilation, or murder, not just a sacrificial death on an altar. It had seven horns, this means having all power, and seven eyes, this means having all wisdom, which are the seven spirits of God that have been through excuse me, sent throughout the whole earth. American Bible Society Good News Translation. So what gives the Lamb permission to unseal the seals? Wasn't God the Father capable, the Holy Spirit capable? What we are seeing here is that Jesus Christ, the Lamb, by his life and his death, was able to open up the true meaning and the true reasons for the history of our world and to show the correct interpretation of all that has happened. Thus, he is not just a sacrifice offered to pay a debt, He's also a revealer of the truth about God and about Satan. Jesus has conquered Satan, who is a liar, by revealing the truth. So how do you deal with lies? You reveal the truth, exactly. God could have 
easily finished off Satan and all of his evil followers snap of his fingers and by the use of his omnipotent power. But God does not work that way. He will win the great controversy not by the use of force, but by the revelation of truth. And where is the truth revealed? It comes from the very midst of the throne from God himself, the Lamb. God does not ask anyone else to reveal the truth about him because they could not. The questions were about God and his government and his character. And who's, that, who's raising all those questions? Satan. Satan. Those questions could only be answered by God himself because it's about God. We notice that the word for killed there, shvadzo in, in Greek, in the New Testament is used in places like 1 John 3, 12, Revelation 5, 6, 9, and 12, 6, 4, 9, 13, 3, and 8, and 18, 24. And these places it is clear that this word refers not just to sac to a just, just a sacrifice offered on an altar, but to murder, violence, slaughter, as in war. So what are we saying here? We're saying, well, let me just finish this. Although slay, and this is a quote from a, a very important Revelation commentary, although slay, the Greek word sphazo, may be used in the sense of an animal sacrifice ritual, I mean a complete ceremony with you know, the animal being torn apart and all that. The more usual meaning is to kill a person with violence. So what does this tell us? Incredible as it may seem, God wins the great controversy by dying. And why does he do that? The answer is given by God himself, who is the victor in the great controversy. God said that sin leads to death. Satan said, oh no, sin doesn't lead to death. So what do we find? We find Christ himself dying the death of sinners, a violent death at the hands of his enemies. But ultimately he died of sin, proving his original statement in the Garden of Eden that sins leads to death. And what is the response from the holy ones, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the millions of angels around the throne? There is rejoicing that God has won and then a period of silence. Why? They're surprised. They're shocked. You could just see them rejoicing and then think, whoa, what an incredible story. God's answer to these questions initially seemed unbelievable. But when the truth is fully understood, God wins. And are we ready to see that truth spelled out in our lives? Our kind and loving Father. We should, we should also stand in awed silence as we listen to this story. A story that None of us could possibly have guessed that God would win this way, but he has. And we should be so thankful. And so we want to offer our thanks right now, as the angel standing around the throne did, saying, honor and glory and power belong to you, Lord. We want to thank you again. Amen.